and welcome back to reading an APA style article part. And now we've wrapped up uh, the introduction section, so we moved on to the method section. Uh, in the method section, uh, you know you could look at that, and you're going to get some uh, very specific information. For example, go and look at the articles method section for study one, and answer these questions: What animation software did they blah, blah, did they use? How did they vary race, and how did not they vary race? What? No, how did and how didn't they vary the race in the experiment? And how many frames long was each clip? You'll notice that the answers are very, very specific, which is appropriate for a method. There's going to be uh, generally three parts to a method section, that is three subsections. The first is participants, uh, and that will describe the characteristics of the people in the study. Uh, unless, you're, of course, you're doing research with animals, then it's called subjects, and it'll describe the characteristics of the animals in your study. Then there'll be either a materials and or an apparatus section. Materials is used to describe pencil and paper materials. Tests that you use, questionnaires that you design, that's in a materials section. Apparatus actually uh, you know, describes uh, equipment that you use. And then finally, you'll have a procedure section. The procedure section will describe what happened to uh, the participants, in what order, it will describe how you randomly assigned uh, uh, participants to groups. It will describe uh, control measures that you use. It will describe how you've manipulated variables and how you've operationally defined variables. So uh, those are the three sections. Uh, take a look at the procedure section, which begins at after giving informed consent, participants were seated in uh, computers at computers and cubicles. And based on what uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, Kurt and Gail did, uh, can you timeline the order of what happened to the participants? In fact, you can, and you should stop now and go back and do that. Also, if you're confused about what the IAT is, where can you go for more information? Well, I want you to go look at that, but I'll tell you the answer. Uh, you can go to a research article that they cited uh, so that if you want more information about the IAT, you can go and look that up. And then we move on to the results section. One thing I want you to focus on in this article in the results section is this graph. Uh, the graphs follow the standard rule that the y-axis contains information about the dependent variable. The x-axis contains information about the independent variable. So in this graph, we see that the independent variable, which is on the y-axis, is response latency. That is how long it took uh, the subjects to push the button uh, to indicate they saw a change in the emotion of the face. And then one independent variable is level of implicit prejudice. And there's two levels of that independent variable. Minus one standard deviation, or people who have lower than average implicit prejudice. And plus one standard deviation, people who have higher than average implicit prejudice. Also, if you have more than one, if you have two independent variables, there'll be a legend box, or a legend uh, sign, on your graph. And indeed, we have two independent variables. The first one is level of prejudice. The second is race. And in that legend box, you'll have the different uh, levels of the second independent variable. So we know that our second independent variable has two levels, black faces and white faces. And it tells us which line to pay attention to when we want to look at the data for black faces versus white faces. And so as the level of implicit prejudice increases, that is, as you read from left to right, what happens to the response latency for white faces and for black faces? Try to uh, come up with a verbal summary of the graph and then compare this to their hypothesis. That's all, really, I want you to be able to take from that results section for the first study. Uh, the rest of the results are, are scary, and you shouldn't be able to uh, really understand them 
uh, until you take statistics. But don't worry about that. Because in APA SOL, the author should restate uh, the results of the uh, experiment at the beginning of the discussion. And since this paper has two studies, uh, this restatement is done at the beginning, literally the first sentence, of the section uh, you know, titled Study 2. Go take a look at that sentence and see how they sum up the results of Study 1. Why two studies? Why did they do two studies? Uh, they say, they explain that uh, at the beginning of uh, section, uh, the section for study two by saying, however, it might be the case that slower response times were a result of greater indecision or inhibited perceptual processes of black faces among the people of, more, uh, of greater prejudice. Let's go over that again, because that's a very densely packed uh, sentence. It might be the case that slower response times were the result of greater indecision or inhibited perceptual processes of black faces among more prejudiced persons. What does that mean? Well, what they're describing here is a process that's different than prejudice. Prejudice is when people uh, have certain attitudes, uh, in this case implicit attitudes, about black people, black faces and it causes changes in how they perceive black faces versus white faces. That is, when they see a black face and they're prejudiced against black people, they will take uh, you know, a much longer time to see anger leave that face because they consider that black, one of the things uh, among their prejudice about black people is that black people are angrier than white people. That's different than what they're saying here. They're saying that high prejudice people, because they're high prejudice, they may have gotten into a lot of like, you know, conflicts in life being high prejudice. And so now they're kind of like gun shy around black people. Or you put them in a psychology experiment and you start showing them a picture of a black face. They say, oh, the psychology experiment must be about race, and I've gotten into so, many, so much trouble before, I better be careful. And so because they're being careful, they're waiting and thinking about their judgments, as opposed to the low prejudice people who are just responding as fast as they notice something. So you see, that process is different than being prejudiced. Being gun-shy and double-thinking about everything is not prejudice, but it could lead to the results that we saw. And that's why they needed to do two studies. And in the second study, what they did is they developed a way of weeding out or answering this uh, you know, counter-argument that, hey, your results are not due to prejudice, but your results are due to high prejudice people being gun-shy about making judgments about uh, black people. Probably what happened, and I have some evidence for that, is that they did the first study, and they got the results they wanted, and you know, they high-fived each other in the lab, and they sent off the uh, paper to the journal. And remember, uh, this is a peer-reviewed uh, article, so it went to peer reviewers. And probably one peer reviewer, or maybe both of them, looked at this and said, well, you know what? The authors didn't really recognize or, or try to account for this gun-shy process, that is, that people high in prejudice may be a little bit more cautious. And so how are you going to deal with that? And so then the editor you know, emailed them and said, well, this one reviewer had this really good comment, and uh, you know, we're not going to publish uh, your paper unless you answer it. And so they realized, oh, what, one thing we have to do is we have to do a study like study number two, which answers that uh, argument, that counter-argument. And so they quickly did it, and then they sent this two-study paper back to the editor, and it was accepted and published. And then finally, we have the discussion section. Uh, in the discussion section, uh, look to see, uh, go over the, and look to see and look up what Sukman says about the discussion section. She describes that there's an inevitable part, a confessional part, and a creative part. The inevitable is that you have to describe the results of the experiment and talk about your hypotheses. 
The confessional is that you have to talk about problems with your experiment. That is, did you do something wrong that you didn't catch till it was over? Did the results come out not perfectly, but kind of okay? Well, if these are the cases, then you have to fess up and you have to explain what you did wrong and how these could be fixed in future studies. And if you have a you know, really long confessional section, probably your paper is not going to be published because you have too many problems with it and you have to do it over again before you can even try to send it out to be published. And then the final part is what Sukman calls the creative, uh, in that what you need to do then is be creative and talk about how your results relate to other theories or other studies and how your results uh, relate to uh, broad questions about practice. What do people do in real world situations? Or what should no, uh, you know, future researchers look at now that we have the results of your uh, wonderful experiment? So if we go to uh, 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 Hugenberg and Bodenhausen's article, uh, the inevitable comes right at the beginning of the general discussion. And in those two paragraphs, they basically go through inevitably what has to be discussed, that we did find what we were looking for, and here's how we know it. And uh, the creative section occurs later on in the discussion section, uh, where they talk about uh, the IAT, that is other theories, and implications for research and other things. That's the creative part. And then there's finally the confessional. And in Hugenberg and Bodenhausen's article, there really is, is not a confessional section. Uh, the reason why is Gail Bodenhausen is a really famous psychologist, and he's good, and so he designed a really good study. Another reason is that it went through two uh, different studies, two iterations, uh, because the reviewers caught the first mistake. So that there really isn't any problems for them to be confessional about. Normally, in a discussion section, you'll see a confessional section uh, where a paragraph will start out with something like, one limitation of the study is this, or as one reviewer pointed out, we did this and we shouldn't have, or we could have done this. And another way they talk about the confessional section is by saying things such as, future researchers may wish to look at this. And so that's it for an APA-style paper.